Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to the launch of the second edition of the ESDP Entrepreneurial Skill Development Program run through the Enrich uh, project, the European Network of Research and Innovation Centers and Hubs uh, uh, USA. So uh, today, the 23rd of July 2020, the session will give you an outline of uh, the whole program, but we have the pleasure of having, uh, you know, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Bob Smith. Now Bob will be introduced uh, briefly. While we are waiting for a few more people to join us, I invite you to take your mobile phone or if you prefer, just open a side window from your browser and uh, uh, write uh, www.menti.com. I can just uh, show you briefly the slide with the code. So menti.com, it's on the right side of the screen and uh, press add the passcode 9738. Six. Okay, so this will allow us to uh, have an interactive uh, set of questions from the audience. So you will know more about who's present, what's their idea, vision, uh, idea of a project, uh, their state uh, or, or challenges in innovation, but also to submit questions directly to the speakers as. Uh, you will hear their presentation and there will be a lot that you can ask i assure you because it's a great uh, i mean it's it's really a honor to have bob with us um, moreover you will also be having an introduction of the whole enriched program and of the esdp second edition of the esdp we just finished uh, an assessment of the first edition we just wrapped it up and uh, it was uh, really successful. It really helped uh, all the participants uh, to improve their communication skill, to network, because the whole program, it's, you know, it's a gold mine of networking. You will be meeting uh, incredible people. Uh, the ambassadors, well, uh, I can't remember the exact term. Yes, we have people that you can uh, speak to, to give you direct uh, suggestions, idea to, to help you to network with others. And uh, we will also have at the end, uh, because she's now doing a specific project, one of the first participants to the edition, to one of the participants to the first edition, so Manuela Saracino, uh, who is, uh, well, I'm sure you all know what astrocytes are. Well, if you don't ask uh, Manuela, because she is uh, really a, an expert, uh, a, a postdoc working on uh, on uh, astrocytes. I can tell you, astrocytes are, we all have them. Yeah, I mean, most of us have them. They are uh, connecting, uh, helping. Uh, uh, we all have, have heard of neurons and synapses. Well, the secret to make those work apparently, through research, are these astrocytes. They are called astrocytes because they are like stars. They have more uh, spikes. <laughs> so we'll be speaking about that. But while I am kind of filling in, uh, I ask uh, the art direction and Claire if we can open the session completely. Yes please. Yes, yes, okay. So, uh, I'm already in the slide and, uh, well, I will be moderating the session, so you will hear my voice and see me sometimes, but our guest uh, main speaker is Bob Smith, and I kindly ask uh, Mende Yangden from our ESDP team to briefly introduce Bob. Thank you, Paolo. So it is with great pleasure and honor that I welcome Bob Smith, um, who is the director of iCorps at George Washington University. At GW, Bob manages the strategic direction of GW's iCorps and global lean startup programs. 
Prior to GW, he was the director of the Innovation Commercialization Assistance Program, or ICAP, where he worked with universities, accelerators, and local startup ecosystem, and he assisted in their new rented development initiatives. Bob has 30 plus years of experience in innovation and entrepreneurship, and as an executive angel investor and advisor, he has helped companies in e-commerce, e-government, identifier management, publishing, geospatial analytics, data science, and media to move from ideas to favorable exits. And Bob has also been a speaker in our previous uh, uh, first edition of the ESDP, and it is with very high demand that we bring back Bob this time as our uh, keynote speaker for our launch. And we are all very excited to hear your presentation, Bob. And uh, Bob is also great fun. We can add <laughs> that, So, but you will see and hear in a few minutes uh, because before, uh, giving the floor to Bob, I will briefly uh, introduce uh, the ESDP team and uh, then uh, have some questions. So we we have uh, as a team. Uh, I I don't know if Joanna Joanna has a sore throat uh, and uh, but I uh, assure you that when she speaks, it's like uh, listening to the crystalline water. Of a, of, a, of a stream and uh, Joanna is a team leader at the DLR and uh, is together with uh, Claire. Well, Claire, I now give the floor to the others who have the possibility of speaking. Claire, well, introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Claire. I'm from INCURA, National Council of University Research Administrators. I'm currently a director of a global initiative at INCURA. We're based in Washington, D.C., and our members are research administrators and research managers at 40 different uh, countries, universities, research institute, and private uh, enterprise, etc. And with this, uh, I will hand it back to Paulo. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And uh, then we have uh, a magician with uh, e-learning and uh, online activities. Well, Ilka, can you just briefly say a few words? about yourself. <laughs> yes, thank you, Paolo. Um, my name is Ilka, and I'm from the DLR Project Management Agency. We are based in Bonn, but I'm now tuning in out of Cologne. Um, and within our ESDP Online Academy, I'm responsible for uh, promotional activities as well as the participant management, and I will be talking about the program later on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ilka. And as part of the team uh, organizing all the technical aspects, but also the communication, well, Mende, briefly uh, introduce yourself. You already spoke and presented uh, beautifully, <laughs> Bob. Um, thank you, Paolo. So my full name is Mende Tujiangdun, and I'm from Bhutan, and I'm working as a junior consult uh, consultant with Paolo. Um, and for the ESDP online program, as Paolo mentioned, I'll be helping with all the technical aspects as well as a participant management with ILCA. Thank you. Thank you, Mende. And uh, well, um, about myself, uh, I am a certified professional facilitator uh, with the International Association of Facilitators, and I mainly work on uh, future strategies, futurizing product and service development through my company called Futur, working all over the world. And it's a pleasure to be also collaborating with such a great team. Before we now give the floor to Bob, let's reflect and know a little more about who's listening, who's with us. We have, uh, uh, how many participants uh, connected at the moment? I have 20 many? plus. Okay. so. Um, as uh, I gave you the code, uh, uh, and I just remind, remind people, uh, the code uh, is uh, menti.com. You just uh, on your mobile phone, menti.com or your browser, and then the passcode is 97386. You, the first question is just uh, where are we connecting from? What country are we connecting from? As you Wonderful. As you start typing your information, you will uh, you will see the results appearing. 
and the code for Menti is also written at the top for whoever is joining us uh, right now. So if you want to submit your, so we have Germany, China, Italy, Greece, uh, maybe it was the Czech Republic, Switzerland, uh, yes, China, Bhutan, and here we can see there's 10 replies at the moment, 11, what was the next one? Oh yes, Cologne, maybe, yeah, the German. Just another few seconds to give you the time to send your uh, questions. So I just remind the participants that to vote in this first part, which also helps uh, Bob Smith to get an idea because the next question will be more technical. So please uh, send your answers to just uh, make a tailor-made and much more focused uh, to the point. Bob, you are with me, so we can also now comment specific questions together uh, on the go. So I would say that now, unless more questions, more answers come, we have uh, also people from Portugal, Finland, Czech, we said, Hungary. So welcome everybody. It's a very international uh, group of participants. The next question is about the fact that you have the possibility throughout the session to submit questions to the speakers. To do that, you just have to uh, add the surname. So if it's Bob, you would say Smith. If it's Claire, it's Chen. If it's, but anyway, add your question. And uh, once the question appear, they will be shown uh, on, your, uh, on your mobile phone, uh, you have the possibility of seeing all the questions from everyone else and vote them so that the ones that get most likes go to the top and will be answered first. So you may uh, you may also piggyback on others, other people's questions. I will remind people to do this because uh, the whole thing is really fast, but the moment you have a question, take your mobile phone send it and we will have a Q&A session at the end of Bob and if more questions pop up also at the end of the whole round. So this was just to remind you that throughout the session you can submit a question whenever you want. Let's see also what sector you are in. Okay, we have uh, people from government, academia, non-profit, other industry, so this is like a snooker table. The moment you start getting uh, more ideas uh, coming in, more, more, more balls uh, on the table, they will hit or mo mobilize the others. So we have quite a balanced group, uh, still more coming. We have uh, non-profit government, academia, other, and I would give you another few seconds, just, this is an easy one, you just have to tap with your finger on the, on the touch screen of your mobile phone and select which question you, which one represents you, okay? So we have, uh, Oh yes, we. I was just saying we still don't have someone from industry, so we have uh, three people out of the participants from academia, uh, four from non-profit, two from government, two from other, and one from industry. I will now move on to the next slide. So uh, you are here, you know, here we, the whole idea of the entrepreneurial skill development program is to help you transform your idea into something that then creates value. So do you have an idea for a product or service? Uh, are, you, are you already reflecting on how to transform your research uh, into something that can create value? So we are getting here three people that have a yes and 
uh, five, that's uh, four. Yeah, it's moving up, changing. So do you have an idea for a product or a service? I just give you another few seconds for anyone who has just joined. The way to give your instant uh, feedback and polling is by writing on your browser or from the mobile phone, menti.com, www, it's at the top, and use the code 97386. So here we have uh, people who don't yet have an idea for a product or service, but maybe have a great research, uh, research activity on which they are working. Bob, do you want to comment this? I will when I take myself off mute. Um, no, I mean, it seems like it's pretty mixed. Love to hear from all of the attendees, of course, but um, just, you know. We, we, we just move on and see from yeah. also from the next questions. Thank you, Bob. And uh, next one, uh, what is your sector of innovation or research? So you have medicine and healthcare, food and agriculture, e-commerce, retail, energy, electronics, IT, communication, entertainment, or other. So other. Hmm. Well, out of curiosity, Bob, maybe you were going to say the same. Whoever has other, would it be possible for you to send your other into the chat of the go to meeting uh, uh, you should see it in your screen you have uh, the possibility of submitting in your chat your uh, comments so it would be interesting for us also to have yeah. lots of others well, yeah lots of others so interesting yes so we have one in electronic one in e-commerce two in medicine, healthcare, and many others. Please help us to know a bit more. Just send uh, in the chat of the GoToMeeting uh, that you have. Uh, so it's uh, in between the different lines. You have the possibility to send your chat uh, about what other is for you. And uh, well, uh, what is the stage in which your idea concept is in? Is it uh, just still uh, idea, basic research? Is it in the demonstration lab? Uh, and uh, I couldn't now not read, but the last one was it, is it already a product or a service? So we have an idea for basic research, demonstration in the field, clinic, yes. And uh, yeah, then there was validation and trials. And uh, production yes so the only one that uh, is not uh, yeah yeah the demonstration is present field cleaning demonstration in the lab animal is not nobody from that session so yeah, I give you another 30 seconds for this so it's uh, again I remind uh, whoever has joined uh, just now that if you want to, to we, we want to know more about you so that you all know more about everyone else in the room. So to submit your replies, uh, as you see at the top, the, when we have the question, menti.com and code 97386. So thank you very much. Bob, comments on this? No, probably what I would have expected. Um, I would imagine that if you're if you launched your product or you're in production, you're most likely out there trying to sell it. So that's a good first lesson is if you have something, go out and sell it. Excellent. Thank you, Bob. So uh, we have just a few more questions before I give you the floor. So as we are here to help, where, where do you need help? Is it in the engineering of your idea, in the business side, in the regulations and standards? more in the legal aspects, in the marketing. Here, for this question, you can just uh, distribute your uh, percentage points. So you have uh, a maximum of 100 tokens, and you can just say, um, well, I would say I would spend all my 50 tokens into legal aspects, or 20 here, 10 there, 12 in another. So you are balancing with the, the, the main, uh, so 
if you have an idea, if you're doing some research, where could you need more help from our uh, panel of experts? Other marketing, legal, regulation, standard, there's coming more, okay. So at the moment, business support and funding is at the top, but funding has a, like a horse race, funding has just overtaken business and marketing is running behind. Yeah, marketing is running up, legal is just on the fourth position, but it's our regulation has overtaken <laughs> other. And uh, let's see, in the horse race, funding is- Yeah, where's the dark horse? The win <laughs> Who's coming Sorry? from behind at the last? Who's coming from behind at the clubhouse turn? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Good, good. So let's say that funding and business are top. So it's you have just the right person as the speaker uh, because uh, Bob can give us a lot of insights on this, and uh, all the other topics uh, will also be. Uh, tackled during the program, regulation, standard, legal aspects. Oh, business is running up. Yeah, we have given another. So maybe uh, if I wait the, another. He's a comer, that business, you know, never count him out. It's like, yeah, uh, yeah, you're, you're right, you're right. Yeah, business, maybe business will overtake funding <laughs> at this point. Right. So uh, just, I think, one or two more slides. Thank you. Thank you, really, everyone, for your uh, contribution so you all know more about everyone else funding business and marketing together with legal out of the top so this is the uh, this is the last one and then I give the floor to Bob uh, which type of innovator are you you know are you an experienced commercialization researcher are you an experienced pure science with potential commercial are you a new researcher or are you a pure science non-commercial? Maybe, Bob, just you can, as it's one of the topics you are dealing with, uh, is there an explanation that can help people yeah. understand more the I will at the end of I will at the end of my talk give a, um, a highlight, one of our George Washington University uh, professors that is uh, what I would put in that first category, experienced commercialization person. They've done three or four businesses out of their university position. But a lot of times I talk to new researchers, people that might be uh, just entering, you know, leaving their undergraduate or into their grad uh, uh, education, maybe, a pre, you know, coming in as a, as a doctoral student. And so we see a lot of those kinds of people that are just trying to figure out, well, what kind of, what kind of um, research should I do? Should I do pure science? Some people are pure science. I've had many uh, faculty that I've dealt with um, that, just say, look, I, I just love the research. I'm not necessarily looking to commercialize it. But sometimes they come across something. They go, is there a commercial potential for this? So you see, you see a lot of different cases. Um, uh, it's rare that somebody that that is a pure science, and we're seeing indications of that, doesn't yeah. want to at least see their their research used. But I also work with uh, you know the Jefferson Lab here in in the United States, and mm -hmm. a lot of their scientists just want to figure out what happens at at the atomic level, and uh, they do you know nuclear yeah. physics yeah. and they're not really so interested in theoretical physics and they're not really interested in commercializing that. So here you have the picture of our participants. We have three uh, with experienced commercialization researcher as a type of innovator, three with experience pure science with potential commercial and four new researchers. Welcome everybody. Now I pass you uh, the presentation, Bob, and I will disappear in the background. May I remind you, everyone, everyone, that you can all, while Bob is speaking, but also on the basis of what you just uh, heard, submit your Q&A uh, uh, within uh, the Menti system. So questions are possible for everyone to be submitted while this, uh, this activity is running. So Bob, it's your floor. Good, okay. Well, great. Well, thank you, everybody, um, and thank you, uh, Paolo, and and, um, and thank you to the kind, our kind hosts for asking me to come. So I'll get started. Um, as mentioned, uh, I run what's called the National Science Foundation's I Corps program at George Washington University, um, and um, that means that I 
I teach lean startup and I teach uh, companies how to, um, especially faculty and researcher teams, how to uh, commercialize their technologies. I've been doing that particular work for about um, six years now. And before that, I spent a lot of time uh, almost exclusively as a startup entrepreneur. Um, in fact, the only big company I ever worked for started out as a, I was the hundredth per person in, and I found out I wasn't so great in big companies, and I left to do more companies. Uh, sadly, now I'm at a university, which is not a big, it's a big company. Uh, so I, I, this is really one of my first experiences being in that kind of environment. But anyway, I'll tell you a little bit about how we look at things at George Washington. Um, we've sort of mapped out the innovator's journey, beginning with the, the basics of education. Those of you that are, you know, just taking classes, hanging out, doing those things, uh, all the way through um, an ultimate commercialization of research you've been doing um, that forms an idea that starts to turn into a business model, uh, that starts to turn into a business that hopefully ultimately turns into uh, what we entrepreneurs love, which is an exit. Uh, exits are some kind of sale or as uh, we say, uh, a liquidity event, meaning that uh, you have uh, cashed out, your investors get to cash out or, uh, or so forth. That's in the business environment. I saw a number of teams that were on not for profits or such. Um, there's not necessarily exits in that, but the same, pretty much the rest of the uh, of this uh, pathway uh, is is fairly similar. So we break it down into three uh, sections then, three phases of this development. And the first is kind of the investigative phase. It's the phase where you're just trying to figure out, you know, first of all, learning the science. Secondly, uh, isolating on a few things you're really interested in and pursuing at depth, and uh, doing the kinds of research that produces. Um, things like uh, breakthroughs that hopefully are, are great breakthroughs that turn into intellectual property of some kind, or they turn into um, ideas for businesses. That puts you into this incubator phase, and you can see that the phases tend to overlap a little, so there aren't really clear cut and dried lines. Um, and some of you may come in at this phase. You may have a business idea you're already working on. Um, so it doesn't, you know, there are different entry points to this continuum. But in the incubation phase, you know, we, that's when you're you're doing things like working on your business model and working on trying to test and see if there's some commercial potential for your opportunity. And then in the acceleration phase, uh, you get into uh, how do you prepare for the market? How do you make sure that you're getting ready to to go out and that you in fact have uh, you can prove you have a viable um, opportunity? Now I don't highlight the execution phase, which is the final one, um, because we don't really um, get too much into that. So anyway, um, a couple of things before you start. Um, and so one of the things I always uh, talk to people about in thinking about their journey through this process is um, that the, you know, your journey will always be dependent on you. Um, because the first thing I always say to a, an entrepreneur is, what do you want out of life? And I say it to the same person that ever wants to go down this sort of path, because that should really dictate a lot of how you go about it and what you want. And there's some questions that you should be asking yourself is first of all, it helps to have an idea. Um, you know, where am I on this continuum? Um, what sector am I going into? That's what Paolo was talking about, some of those things. What access to resources do I have? Am I sitting alone in my basement like I am here now? Uh, or am I out in an environment where I'm, I'm in a research rich environment that's gonna be the best kind of um, uh, incubator, if you will, um, for my idea? Um, you know, what's your desired outcome? Uh, I always think that, you know, one of the things I say to people, and I call them jokingly Bobisms, is, um, you know, you can't really pick a good direction if you don't have a destination. Um, I've tried. I used to be a navigator um, for a number of years. And I can tell you that if you don't know where you're going, every direction looks good. So you should kind of understand what you want at the end of that. And a big one, maybe the biggest one at the bottom is, is your tolerance for risk. Not everybody is built for risk. Um, I can tell you uh, that um, I actually made a comment to one of the people uh, that works for me yesterday and we're going through, uh, we're doing a lot of change because that's what I do. And, uh, and, and she was a bit, you know, sort of like, you know, oh boy, this is, you know, hard. And I said, no, this is what winning feels like. Winning is painful. Win you know, winning, you get about five seconds of Yahoo. The rest of it is pain. And so, and it's risky and, and you can fail. And so one of the things we always want to tell people when they start on this process is, you know, failure isn't an option. It's a requirement. It's, it's, it's your daily habit. Wake up, fail, learn, repeat. 
Um, so if you don't like that, if that's not the way you want to live your life, um, there are much more profitable ways of doing that. So knowing what you really want out of life is the key to success. There's your piece of philosophical wisdom for the day. But it really does apply in seeing, do you want to make this path and how? So for instance, um, what's your motivation? Um, if maybe you want to save the world, maybe you want fame and fortune, you know, maybe you want to just see if your ideas work. Maybe you want to feel secure and safe um, or maybe you want to, you know, you don't love working hard on something. Um, maybe you love taking responsibility for your uh, for your actions. Maybe you wake up every day and say, hey, it's on me. It happens. Something went wrong. It's me. Uh, and or maybe you like to be rewarded for your performance. And um, so. My guidance to people when they come into me and talk to me and I check on their on their motivation. If somebody tells me they want to save the world, I go, well, lower your expectations. You don't save the world. First thing an innovator has to understand is you're not saving the world. You're doing a very small thing that hopefully makes somebody's life better. And if that ultimately results in the world being saved, hey, good for you. But you can't really act on that. And we want to make sure that the people that are coming to us are draw, developing plans they can act on, not just aspire to. Uh, fame, forget it, I can't predict that. Um, or same kind of thing with wealth. Uh, people come to me and they say they wanna be an entrepreneur. I used to ask in, the, in these things, and maybe Paolo the next time, is uh, do you, are, do you wanna develop something because you wanna be rich? And when people say sometimes yes, I say, well, go get a job in finance because it's, you can't predict it. It's, it's, I always tell people, if I could make you Zuckerberg, I'd be Zuckerberg. Um, if you want to see if your idea works, if you have a passion for sort of seeing, well, I have this idea. I wonder if this works. You could be an entrepreneur, maybe. If you want security and safety, you don't want to be an entrepreneur. There is no security. There is no safety. There is no fame. There's just a lot of hard work. So if you like hard work, you might be an entrepreneur. If you love waking up and saying, it's on me, you're definitely in the strike zone for an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs don't make excuses. If you're ever in a room full of entrepreneurs, experienced entrepreneurs, real entrepreneurs, not pe people that have done it, not people that talk about it, like me, I'm talking to you now, but I have done it. Um, they will say that you, they all talk about their failures and they, none of them are saying, oh, the dog ate my homework. They're all saying, ah, oh, I made the stupidest mistake. I'm such a pinhead. And it sounds like a bunch of woe is me, but it's not. It's sort of like, nope, nobody's to blame. I wake up every morning and I know it's on me. And the final is being reward for, rewarded for your performance. You want to see something tangible come back. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean money. It could mean fame, but uh, fame is fleeting. No, you shouldn't want fame. But but what you might want is a response. You might want, oh, I actually made that better. I, I can measure that I made it better. And that being rewarded for your efforts like that is a motivator for folks like us. Um, so before you start again, remember that inventions and products don't matter. The only thing that matters are the people you're trying to help with those inventions. And that sounds trite and, and you know, self-serving uh, uh, to say, but it, it really is a tangible reality. It's, it, it, is a, it is a real reality. If you go in thinking your invention is the center of the universe, you fail because you have to understand the people you're trying to help. And uh, so I'll give you an example. Here's one quick example. This is the Apple Newton. Now, most of you probably on this call weren't alive when the Apple Newton came out, maybe, but uh, I was. I actually was one of the early owners of it. I was, uh, and um, it was a pretty fascinating device. It was created in 1993. It was the first, um, you know, what we used to call personal digital assistant uh, from Apple that ultimately resulted in what you use now as an iPhone. But they invested huge amounts in it. They had really cool things like handwriting recognition, you name it. Lots of great functionality, lots of great inter integrations, everything you would expect now in, a, in an iPhone or a, a Samsung phone or whatever. But it was a dismal failure because nobody cared about it. The reason was they had handwriting recognition that didn't work. So again, they built a feature that was not only extraneous, but it was didn't function well because they loaded it up with features. They charged too much for it. They didn't understand where the market was. They were, they were trying to introduce a new paradigm for, for entry of data and such at a time when the keyboard was still state of the art. So needless to say, that it was a dismal failure, but, not, but no good failure should be wasted. And Apple did learn a lot. Jobs learned a lot from this. So when they came out with the iPod and then ultimately phone and pad, um, they learned a lot from this and it helped them. 
So just being real clear, the customers you're trying to help, the people, the humans that you're trying to help, um, whether they're a customer and they're going to buy your product or a stakeholder that you're trying to get to. Uh, ultimately, those are the people that determine the value. Uh, the, I know the theme of this was determining the value of your, of your um, research. I can tell you, but it's always externally determined. You don't determine it. And um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about that journey and how that these things shape uh, up during that. Um, so look at let's look at phase one, that investigation phase, okay? So um, what are you personally doing in that phase? Well, you might be doing a lot of stuff. You might be attending classes, for instance, and you're trying to get your degree. Um, you might be conducting research um, and you might've been working at it for a while and you're curious about how that ha uh, works in the real world or maybe you're just starting a business, right? You, you just want to start a business. And we see all these different types of people at George Washington. So what's your uh, commercialization strategy at this point? Well, the kind of questions you should be asking yourself are, you know, what specifically am I trying to change? Um, what do I think needs to be changed? And then what can I, but what can I reasonably affect um, through this change? So for instance, you, you don't cure cancer, you don't end world hunger, right? But your research might be great into something like, um, I'll give you an example of some research uh, that I worked on out of a lab at NIH, uh, National Institute of Health in the US. And it was a way of converting chicken feathers into a receptor for um, uh, phosphates, which cause water pollution. So I couldn't change the way that um, uh, maybe poor communities uh, filter water. I couldn't change that. I couldn't change the sewage system. I couldn't even make it that they're going to live healthy, happy lives. But I could change this very small thing of maybe making it easier to get pollutants out with a low technology uh, solution. So that focus, that sort of um, understanding of a thing you really want to change as opposed to a broad sort of aspirational goal is part of the key things you should be talking to yourself about at this point. Um, now, the current state of the art is always what you're shooting against. You're always looking for and you want to understand it because you only advance the current state of the art in some way. It could be a big way, it could be a small way, but without understanding that baseline you're, you're operating in, um, it'll be very hard to judge if, you, if your invention really has value. And then uh, how will you approach investigating the, both the domain you want to help, the science behind your innovation, and ultimately a solution that might go to uh, be used in the real world. So the key for that is, um, again, another piece of great philosophy that I'm going to lay on you guys today, which is the bear joke. And uh, in the programs I run, the bear joke is central to um, our entire worldview. So just so that you understand the bear joke, I will now tell it to you. So here it is. Number one, two people are running away from a bear. The first person says, I sure hope we can outrun this bear. And the second person says, I just have to outrun you. So always remember in the innovation game, you're never creating something out of whole cloth. You're always improving upon the way things happen now. That's the essence of innovation. And again, I'm not saying it's not a big jump or it could be a little jump, but it should be a measurable jump because the value of what you're creating will be directly related to the measurable improvement over the current alternatives. So some things you sh um, uh, should think about in evaluating your, your, um, the thing you're creating is, are there existing alternatives in the market? One of the misconceptions people have is that if there's no competition, quote unquote, that's a good thing. I can tell you investors don't like that. Investors don't like things that have no competition because they can't value it for one, and two, they know you probably didn't do your homework and you haven't researched it properly. Um, the second is, is there a sufficiently large growing um, market or industry uh, in the area you want to enter? Um, it's, and that's the sad thing about this sometimes because the crazier your innovation, um, sometimes people can't wrap their brain around how it fits in the world. And that, that's a great challenge to have. Um, what are the regulatory, cultural, or other barriers in the way? Um, you know, any even the best ideas, like I was showing you the Newton, uh, can't break through because the world wasn't ready for them. Their customers weren't ready for them. But you may have something where the regulatory environment uh, prevents you from getting to market anytime soon. So you really want to know those things before you start. And as you're informing your ideas and targeting your research, and if there are any current uh, investment activity 
Um, I deal with a lot of innovations that come from a lot of um, folks out of universities and out of the community at large that say, well, um, I want to go do this and investors aren't investing in that sector. But maybe they're too late and the, and the wave passed or maybe they're way too early. So even if you have a great idea and even if it can help mankind and even if it can do all the great things you say it can, um, the people that will fund things may not understand what you're talking about or may not have a, um, a reference point to go on and they won't invest. Finally, what should your key objectives be at this point? Well, the first thing is to immerse yourself in the sector you have intent, your intend to innovate. I can tell you that um, the truth of the matter is, is it's almost impossible to innovate an industry you know nothing about or a situation you know, you know nothing about. I mean, if I want to figure out how to make uh, the auto, uh, you know, automobile manufacturing plants work more effectively, or if I want to figure out a better way to get, um, uh, you know, plows to farmers in Ethiopia, um, which is an actual project I looked at, uh, both of them actually are projects that come to mind, so I just didn't make them up. Um, without being immersed in that, in that environment you're trying to innovate, you will not innovate well. So you, you have to live it, wake up every day wanting to know, loving the thing that you're trying to understand. Um, start getting educated about the commercialization process. That's what I do. Uh, and we're always happy to help folks with that. Um, understand the support network you need to ex uh, access and start doing it. Um, one of the things that I don't particularly always like about um, uh, being in this uh, in, in general with people is I, I'm not a real networker. I don't like small talk with people, um, which is why actually this COVID thing's working out for me. I'm in my basement. I get to talk, but I don't have to meet people. So I'm kind of shy that way. But you have to get overcome that. You have to get out and meet the people that are going to help you understand your domain and also help guide you through that process and uh, build your professional network. I mean, again, most of that goes around to your early objectives are immersing yourself in the problem in a way that's going to help you um, move on. Um, you also want to understand um, the path to market you're going to take. The funding sources at this point will be things like grants. So you should understand how do I get the grants? What do I need to do? Who know? Who do I know that's good at writing grants? Um, what are the organizations I got to look at? How long does this path take? I can tell you the path to doing a, a software application is dramatically different from the path that you take if you're doing um, a, a new a therapeutic. Um, so you have to understand that. Understand and be prepared for the time that it's going to take. And also understand the common milestones that are going to uh, confront you. So that will ha help you not only sort of understand what you're getting into, but it will help shape your research and shape your idea. And I can tell you most of the granting organizations in the university require some kind of idea of the commercialization potential of the research. Um, that is a movement we've been on for quite a long time. I know that um, you know, uh, different, different um, cultures have a different view than Americans. Um, Europeans, for instance, have always been much more geared toward uh, basic research, uh, fundamental research, as opposed to applied research, whereas Americans, being who we are, we like to, you know, uh, build stuff. So we build stuff. So that's so understand the, the, the um, environment you're in, understand what grant writers are looking for. If you're in the U.S., they want to hear a commercialization plan. So that's phase one. So let's say that you've come up with the idea. You're ready to go. You're starting to put it together. And now comes the time when you're going to go and, and start to incubate that idea. So what are you doing during this incubation phase? Well, um, you're, you're working at Bob, perfecting. Bob, yeah. Bob, hello, hello, Bob. Well, I am sure everyone is really curious. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to cut you here because uh, all the people who will participate will see the video of your full uh, uh, lecture with uh, much more material than this, uh, but uh, this is just to be uh, with, uh, with the timing we promised to all the participants. But I take the opportunity, I mean, you can, you can finish this slide if you, if you want, but I take the opportunity just to remind people that uh, there are lots of questions coming up in the Menti system and then in a few seconds uh, uh, Bob will be replying to them but you can also set your priority on the questions that you like most so I, I give you the time also to reflect on the questions uh, through the Q&A and uh, 
and uh, while we do while we do this, I just remind people that the code to submit your uh, comment or questions for the Q and A is menti.com 97386. And Bob, yeah, just complete the slide. Sorry for that, but it was just to um, just to prepare everyone and remind everyone for the Q and A that will be in a, in a second. Um, is my screen still visible? I just want to make sure. Yes, yes, of course. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so uh, again, what are, what are you doing at the incubation phase? Well, you should be perfecting um, uh, the differentiating elements of the thing you're trying to innovate. Um, that Don't confuse that with product development. I mean, if you're developing intellectual property, um, the way that intellectual property works is it's not just a description of an invention, but it's a series of claims. Those claims tend to be uh, contextual in the sense that if, uh, and to make them stronger. So in other words, if I say that I'm going to create a new way to do webinars, um, that may not uh, necessarily be strong intellectual property. But if I make claims about my, my uh, the, the invention that talk about the specific way slides are presented and so on and so on, um, that makes it stronger. So think about the things that, um, in, you know, with some context about what you're inventing that make the intellectual property stronger and stronger. Um, you should be lining up your uh, funding resources, looking for collaborators, um, and ultimately look to, to protect the intellectual property you're developing. In terms of your strategy at this point, you really want to start thinking about who's that customer or who's that stakeholder that the um, innovation I'm developing is meant to help. And think small about this. In other words, think very narrowly and targeted because specific is, is uh, a much better thing for you than broad. So if you think about who the customer is really, um, you can start to define very specific things you should be working on. Uh, also understand the benefit you're going to give the customer or the stakeholder, because the benefit is the reason you do things, not the fact that you can build something. It's the fact that it benefits someone that really is the most important. And then uh, think about potential, um, you know, who has the most immediate need, because when you can identify the most immediate need or the quicker time to help someone, um, that's going to be the thing that is going to most likely get funded, most likely get supported. If you develop something that could help somebody very far in the future, that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile to, to uh, work on, but it may not be the easiest pathway to get funding. So let me think about something like um, autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles are very cool. They will eventually, we know, be something that's very huge. But you see that the people that tend to be playing in them and getting investment and big grants and stuff like that tend to be well-funded, either large universities um, in basic the research for that or big companies like Google. So um, understand what you know where your technology is going to be and where your innovation best fits and who your best customer is. Uh, and the hint here is um, we will help you evaluate that doing the lean startup process. That's what NSF i does. Um, so, yeah. Question? Okay, okay. I will uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, so, uh, just uh, thank you really very much. I mean, uh, all these things are triggering uh, our imagination because we all have this uh, dream of uh, invention, but it re we always must uh, remember that uh, there's a lot of sweat uh, for uh, any result, and that that doesn't look like sweat if it's part of your passion so uh, you you can uh, you get you can achieve a lot uh, so let's uh, let's uh, just um, shall I shall I take uh, the question screen uh, so I, I, I share my replies so that you can reply on the basis of the however um, you want to work it just go ahead yes, ask questions yes okay I'm going to I'm going to share my my screen uh, right. So let's let's see the questions and uh, of course uh, we are together here and uh, let's see the, the the order the ranking of the likes and I remind everyone that they can still uh, add more questions or with the little thumbs 
see which questions they like most. So, Bob, the first one is, how does this pandemic affect innovation from your observation and daily work? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't have to. Uh, it does make it harder to get out and meet people, but it shouldn't change um, the work that you're doing, especially depending on the stage you're at. Um, it is a very hard time to raise money right now um, because everybody's affected by this, but um, there are still things you can do, still ways that you can investigate and still ways that you can advance your efforts and um, with, that ultimately will bear fruit. So um, that's the best thing I can tell you. Maybe, maybe it's also creating opportunities in terms of new products and services that may emerge can but that is you know if you're in the vaccine world it's a great time to uh because everybody's waiting and they're throwing lots of money at it um some of the things will be transitory I, this wouldn't be a there's a lots of people investing big time in uh personal protective gear um that may be a good thing in the short term um but if history serves as an indicator it won't be a long-term benefit okay so let's uh, mark this question as answered which phase in the innovation journey is the most critical? You described the three main steps, you know, when you are starting and, and uh, according to you, which one is the most, uh, well, time consuming, difficult? Uh... It's, it's impossible to answer because it doesn't, it does, you have to take into consideration what the innovation is, what the stage of it is, how close it is to the market. I mean, you can see somebody spending 10 years of their life perfecting something in the lab, that then goes to market. If it's something in, in the biomedical space, you may get the thing um, off of the lab, but then you might take 10 years to get it approved by regulators. Um, at the same time, sometimes you launch a company and it doesn't happen, nothing really happens much in it for five or six years, and then it takes off. It's, it's so dependent on a lot of factors you can't justify. So really the, the commitment has to be the same through all of them, and, and you can't be predictive completely. Absolutely. The way you were presenting, though, the first step is when you define your objective that, uh, of course, you can uh, reset your objectives uh, as you go. But that's, you know, when you really decide where to go, uh, it's probably quite a quite a complex time, you know, and then it keeps being complex. It never gets easy. It's, if that's it never fun. gets easy. Yeah. But it can be fun. It's always fun. So, Let's see the next one. How do you connect uh, to the people you want to help uh, so as to know what invention or product uh, to develop? Maybe this can be a kind of uh, mentoring or coaching to better define, uh, is there this kind of service where, because you mentioned it as one of the suggestions, you know, what can one, can who can one, Meet so the first or... place to start is if you're in a university environment, like a student or something, then I, I would recommend um, taking every advantage of programs your university might have um, on commercialization, whether it's the tech transfer office or whether it's an entrepreneurship organization. Um, I would look at professional organizations in your area of expertise, um, both inside of academia and out. Um, going to conventions and walk in trade show floors or going to webinars or in a, in a COVID world um joining groups get the 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 key is to get in in um to start getting involved i have found generally as a rule of thumb every new thing i start is uncomfortable for the first six or eight months and then after that it starts to get more familiar and by the time you're in it for a year or two you're very comfortable you know a lot of the players you know how it works so it really is uh that's that's a, that immersion phase i was really talking about and maybe we can also suggest that uh, the entrepreneurial skill development program is also a place because you get in connection with such a expertise and people that. Yeah, uh, when you do it with me, though, we just send you out and tell you to talk to people. So it's not a. An, well, it's that's not a already, you know, it's like saying you have a map, the others don't. So that's, that's uh, precious uh, to know. Thank you. So the next one. And uh, I ask also our uh, art direction of the whole process if uh, we still are, need to be a bit faster with the time. How do I, uh, how to understand my tolerance of risk? You know, you say before getting into such a thing, you need to understand 
how to is there a way are there some tools or some there are some exercises I, I think it well I there probably are I'm not an expert on that I would tell you that I would I always think self reflection is the way to do that if you um you know if you open if you operated a, a lemonade stand when you were a kid or you were always looking to do jobs around the neighborhood to earn a, a couple of dollars or if you ran for class president uh and did something with it as opposed to just a popularity contest uh you're probably somebody that has a good tolerance for risk you don't mind being out there and you don't mind failing um and and that could be an indicator um you know it's sort of i self-reflection is always a big thing but i'm sure there are um i you know Myers Briggs like testing that you can do that sort of says where you fall in the spectrum. Excellent, excellent. So uh, try out, um, go around, uh, do things, uh, practice, get out of your comfort zone, and you'll understand. And also, there are some tests. Let's uh, see the last two questions. How do I know when uh, I need to pivot in order to move forward? So, you know, you need to pivot when the world tells you to pivot. Um, and so the way we do it is we send you out there to talk to people. And uh, as you're talking to people, you find that they keep telling you the same thing over and over again. Um, that's normally an indication over time if the evidence piles up that you pivot. Um, and, um, you know, so um, that's really it. I mean, and look, that's what you use your advisors for. They help you understand when to pivot. They help you understand how to pivot. But, um, but but they can't, shouldn't tell you to pivot. Um, your stakeholder customer should do that. Excellent. Last question. And uh, how do do you understand what you want? Is there a help desk to be coached in this? <laughs> nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. So that that so comes. Thank with, you. Know thyself. First rule is know thyself. Know thyself. Or thank at least you. know know a good imitation of who you want to be. So. Thank you really very much, and uh, it's great to have you with us uh, in the e entrepreneurial uh, skill development program, Bob. Key, stay with us now also for the uh, completion, and I, I will introduce uh, Claire Chen, the director of Encura, who will briefly um, talk about the, the Enrich program and all the benefits of the Enrich program. So Claire, if you want, the floor is yours. Yes, yes, perfect. Thank you. So, thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Bob, for uh, this great kickoff for our second edition public lunch. As uh, Bob have, and Paolo have mentioned, we already done this for the first time already uh, by Enrich in the USA. and. Just to give everyone a very brief overview of what's enriched in the USA, uh, we are the European network of research and innovation centers and hubs uh, in the USA. We are funded by European Commission under Horizon 2020 framework, and we are truly a global network. Under the Enrich network, we have currently Enrich in Brazil, Enrich China, and Enrich in the USA. Uh, the ESDP will be brought to you by Enrich in the USA. Our vision is to create self-sustaining network and centers and hubs in the US to help and support European research and innovation actors uh, through the trainings and technology innovation customization bootcamp uh, sector information webinar like this. We aim to strengthen the ties between Europe and US in innovation market. In the next slide, you will see we have uh, currently uh, the list of our partners. Why is this important for you to know? That we want to share with you our expertise uh, and network. Our partners network will become your network. So we currently have three partners in US, EAEC and Cura in BIA. Uh, and we have partners in Europe who are from associations, European uh, governmental agencies, uh, and also for innovation consultant firm. Uh, and in the next slide, you will see the network uh, and the current map of where we are physically. So we physically have three centers. One in San Francisco, our West Coast Center is managed by our partner EAEC. Uh, the other one, the East Coast Center, based in Boston, managed by NBA. 
and also newly launched Washington DC Center managed by Encura. Outside the three physical centers, we also have seven selected lending hubs to provide the customer, customized network and industry to help whatever your research need is. And we can talk about a little bit about the journey. The enriching the USA company researchers and innovation, uh, innovators along with your innovation journey by providing services at different stage of your expansion process, which will include a sector-specific bootcamp uh, training program like what we are promoting now, the Entrepreneurial Skill Development Program. Uh, well, Ika and Mende will talk a little bit more about that. And also match and pitch training, innovation tour, et cetera. And please stay tuned for our website. And also we have a service webinar tomorrow, uh, starting at 4.30 Central European time to talk about the services and opportunities that Enrich is currently providing. And now with that, I will give the floor to Yoga and Mende to talk about the upcoming exciting opportunity of entrepreneurial skill development program. Yes, thank you, Claire. But before we dive into our program, I just want you to take a look at this poor guy here. And maybe you can relate to some of his questions, like, for example, to whom can I talk? Or um, how to deal with funding and sponsoring? And what about licensing? And uh, this is where the Entrepreneurial Skills Development Program Online Academy comes into play. The ESDP Online, uh, the ESDP Online Academy will be a full week online applicative and practical training that will give you the right entrepreneurial mindset and the soft skills and the hard skills uh, from, to, from the start of your research to you wanting to commercialize in the US. So um, in the next slide, as you will see, uh, if you are an early to mid-stage career EU researcher, plus you are enthusiastic to commercialize in the US at some point in the future, this is the perfect program for you. Our mission is twofold in this, uh, for this program. Uh, first of all, we would, uh, we, would, we would like to give you the necessary skills, training and networks to succeed in the US. And the second uh, part of our mission is that we want to encourage and facilitate bold innovation and entrepreneurship. Exactly. And uh, this is how we structure our entrepreneurial journey or basically your journey. So every week of our online academy will include four main parts, as you see here. And we will start our week on Thursdays with a video lecture. And this video lecture will be held uh, via GoToMeeting, so using this tool. Um, and we will be approximately 45 minutes long with a Q&A session at the end. And every video lecture will touch upon a specific topic of the week and will be brought to you by leading experts from the US. And we really have recruited bright minds just like Bob today. Thank you again, Bob, for your wonderful presentation. And um, experts just like Bob will give you insights, unique insights into their field of research. And after each video lecture, you will receive a small individual assignment or homework, so to say, in order to follow up on the content uh, you have received during the video lecture. And here you will have the unique possibility of receiving a one-on-one -on -one feedback with one of our mission specialists. Um, and though these sessions with our mission specialists um, can be scheduled individually over the course of the week, and we'll give you further opportunity to learn from experts in the field. We will then end our week with a um, interactive crew session on Wednesdays. And here really the whole crew comes together and can discuss the content of the week and share best practices um, within, within our last um, edition of the Online Academy. We really um, had deep discussion on, for example, slogans, and it was a really um, yeah, personal space just between um, us and the um, and our pioneers. And we had a great discussion um, on Wednesdays and Paolo will be there with us, um, our rocket pilot, so to say, and facilitate these uh, sessions. The whole journey um, will be supported by a learning management system where you can connect with your cohort, um, find important pre and post learning documents and also further information. And you can also reach out to the crew there.
And this is really just a short overview about the topics we will be touching uh, throughout the ESTP Online Academy. But please be aware that this program will be tailored to your needs. Um, and we will yeah, really go with your flow and touch on topics you are interested in and maybe ch change a little bit. Um, so yeah, the content might be altered, but nevertheless, we will touch upon some basic areas, um, as you can see here, like, for example, the com commercialization strategies, um, intellectual property management, or funding fundamentals. And as Ilka had already touched on a little bit, um, I will, I'm going to kind of expand on our mission specialists. So one of the things that makes this program quite unique is the opportunity to access our pool of what we call mission specialists or mentors. Um, and our mission specialists are really experts in their own field and they are essential contact points that will guide you and mentor you not only during the process of the program but also post-program. And our mission specialists uh, you know, range from, as you can see, from uh, quantum technology to compliance to science diplomacy to new venture development. And um, as you move on along the program, we'll be adding even more mission specialists as well. And I really do think that this, uh, the fact that participants can access this pool and network of very, very qualified and distinguished individuals is quite a unique part of our ESDP Online Academy. And um, to guide you through this entire process, we are very, very um, happy to introduce you to our crew members. So uh, from our European side, we have Joanna, who is also the team leader of DLR, and also Inka, who is the scientific officer also at DLR. Um, and from the other side of the pond, uh, working from the US, we have Ms. Claire Chen, who is the uh, director of global initiatives at Enkira, and myself, who is a junior consultant at uh, uh, Future, who's working with Paolo. And we are basically the people that you come to if you, uh, to help you um, kind of uh, guide you through this whole uh, program. And if you have any technical difficulties, anything, uh, we are the people that you come to too. Um, and hopefully that we can answer your questions and guide you smoothly through the entire course of the program. Exactly. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, so what do you need to take away today? Basically, uh, the most important step will be to register for our full four-week ESDP Online Academy. You can do this via the link there. We will also send around the registration information after this um, webinar. Um, as a next step, we will conduct then individual strategic calls which, uh, with you to discuss your expectations, wishes and needs. And then on August 5th already, we will have the onboarding session with our first cohort. Um, this will include an introduction of the team and the members, and we can get to know each other there. And we will give you more detailed information about technical prerequisites, logistics, the timing, agenda, all those kind of things. And only one day later, um, we will start with the takeoff um, and the first video lecture. So here again, uh, you can find us. This is where we are. We are on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And um, again, the registration link, most importantly. And please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mende and Ilka. And uh, just to connect to what you were saying, I don't think you mentioned Ilka. Say just one second. But uh, if I'm right, the whole thing that you have been talking about, and there are not two zeros missing, is a kind of, at the moment, there is a kind of a possible contribution of uh, the minimum is uh, what? Tell me the minimum. 39. 39 so euros. We actually, euros, not yes, million exactly. euros, 39 <laughs> euros. And uh, 59 <laughs> euros or 79 euros. But did you miss two zeros? No. <laughs> no, it's not. No, we did. But the value, the we value, actually... be, the value is uh, is uh, exactly is uh, one hundred times more. I can assure you, and you will also hear in a few seconds, in a few seconds, also one of the participants who would talk about it. So it's because we 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 are within the framework of a. Uh, European uh, and uh, together with the US uh, uh, co collaborative activities. So this is possible. And uh, just
just to, to answer to the lab, before I give the floor to Manu, uh, one of the pioneers from the first edition, just uh, there was a one last question and uh, it was relating to the fact of uh, finding your, your own purpose. Well, as part of the activities we are going through the onboard, doing through the onboarding and throughout the process, we are also helping all the researchers to find their vision and motivation. So Manu, just uh, what's your experience? Uh, your microphone is a bit low. Oh, I tried to... Yeah, excellent, excellent. Where are okay. you now? I can see labs, uh, connectors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> are, are you are you with the astrocytes? Are they there? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, first of all, good afternoon to everybody from Italy, and uh, thanks to all of the REACH members. Uh, just to present myself to the uh, to all the people connected, um, I'm Emanuela Saracino, and I'm coming from Europe, from Italy. And in the specific, uh, I'm now in Bologna, in the CNR, uh, where I'm a research fellow in the Institute for the Organic uh, Synthesis and Photoreactivity. This is our lab that you can see maybe a part of it. And uh, I'm here because I'm joined to the first, uh, to this first appointment as one of the member of uh, the first edition of uh, the Enrich in the US. And uh, I spent almost two months, the last two months, with all uh, the crew of the Enrich, meeting uh, all of them uh, two times per week. One was a really interactive uh, uh, meeting, and one was uh, a lecture given by different specialists, as uh, that of Bob Smith of today. Uh, so I have the, the honor to be part of this first edition, and I just received a few days ago the, my fi final certificate of attendance of the um, reach in the U.S. There, uh, during these two months, I met uh, three guys from uh, two of them, like me, coming from Europe and one from Maryland University. They were completely uh, different in the field of my research because they were more informatics and more in an engineering in engineering sectors. Uh, I can define differently myself as a more pure scientist uh, specialized in uh, neurophysiology. So um, the first suggestion is that even though we come completely from uh, different fields of research, uh, this was really a more stimulant for all of us. All of us uh, have uh, different and enthusiastic brainstorming during the interactive uh, lessons. And uh, it means, uh, first of all, that everybody could join uh, to, the academ to the academy and find uh, um, support from mentors and from the specialists you will meet, as uh, Bob Smith do today, as example. And this uh, lecture about how shaping, how shaping our business idea was also the first uh, for me and uh, was the first bullet of my shaping idea about uh, what me, my colleagues, uh, and my PI, Valentina Benfenati, are developing with our beautiful study on astrocytes uh, that are real cells of the central nervous system, and how big uh, is uh, the contribution we give uh, to the knowledge of uh, brain function and dysfunction, and how big is our potential in the, the application of, of our study to the biomedical market uh, in the future? And especially because uh, neuro disease represents, unfortunately, uh, one of the biggest and increasing social life problem. Uh, just to give you a short overview of my um, experience with Enrich and what I'm doing in the lab uh, is that we try to uncover the mechanism at the base of uh, some function and dysfunction of the central nervous system. We use a multi-scale approach uh, and try to validate materials and uh, interface and adv advanced biomedical device uh, to reveal and understand the molecular and cellular mechanism of astrocytes neuron glial signaling. Um, what what Enrich Academy give to me? 
The Enrich Academy gave me the possibility to receive support online with the specialists coming from the biggest US university and companies who gave me the fundamental information about the commercialization, the economic US system, the patents and the intellectual property knowledge. And during the, these months, uh, you can learn uh, how to have uh, also a good pitch of a few minutes to present uh, your basic idea, to convince someone to become uh, your partner or customers, or uh, learn um, how to require and find uh, uh, how to require funding uh, from uh, US by government or not just from government. And uh, you will uh, um, always feel free uh, to ask and to connect uh, with uh, the mentors, uh, receiving them uh, live sessions and support. Uh, and uh, uh, also, um, I know now something more about the opportunity that uh, um, the US offers to the European researchers uh, and to spread our knowledge between uh, innovators coming from the US uh, university and companies. And uh, the last thing that I want to add is that uh, the marketing aspect and the, and the basic skills on how to build and uh, to have a business idea is a big win and a big challenge for also for the academic researchers and the pure scientists and not just for people already involved in the commercialization. So thank you. And... Uh, all of, all of you can connect with the, 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 the page and the link of the Enrich in the US to have all the information about it. Thank you very much, Manuela. One can just sense and feel your enthusiasm and stay with the camera. I remember that one of the things you said when we were doing the closing that is that you also, you know, that for many of us, the idea of going to America is like a big, uh, you know, and now and you are... And dreaming. Yeah, an American dream. And now you you actually are planning to move, if I remember, because most of the research labs connected to your area of research are close to Baltimore. So you said that yes. this, uh, the ESDP, the Entrepreneurial Skill Development Program, triggered this, uh, you know, now you are ready to and feel that it's the right thing to do. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well... What a wonderful thing. And we were together for two months, but we will keep in touch. I invite all the participants. So our guest uh, keynote, uh, Bob Smith and, and Manu stay together. We just do a final bow to everyone. And uh, so Claire, Mende, Ilka, and uh, although she's not connected, she's with us, uh, Joanna as well. And... Uh, so, so this is just to do, like in the theater, bow to everyone. And uh, remember that you, you just cannot miss this opportunity. Uh, you will get the link after the meeting. Register because, you know, we can, we can make miracles with you.